This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Going back in time a little bit, reaching back for one of my archival episodes, I would like to introduce, reintroduce, Robert Allman, Nobel Prize winner, Game Theory, currently 88 years young. This is one of those episodes that really changed me. I'm not sure exactly why. It was spread out over two calls. We had a bad connection. I was calling Skype to his phone. It was still not a perfect connection. But the way that he talked, the way that he thinks, giving us an insight into game theory, his world, why he got the Nobel Prize, it's inspirational. It changes you to think just a little bit like this man thinks. Now, of course, he knows math like most mere mortals will never know. We can't begin to get into, unless we dedicate our life to it, we can't begin to get into the math complexity that he lives in. But what's so cool about Robert Allman is his ability to take that complexity and give us mortals examples where we can say, oh my gosh, I can taste where he has gone in his life. And I guess, isn't that the definition of a great teacher? I wish like hell when I was 16 years of age, I could have found myself in a classroom with Robert Allman teaching me game theory. But you know, without having that, this, I guess, is the second best thing. Reaching back in time, I hope you enjoy or re-enjoy my episode, my conversation with Robert Allman. I got my first degree at City College of New York, and I did a doctorate at MIT. Hmm. After that, yes, it's true. After that, I did a postdoctorate at Princeton, two right. years. Yeah, And that's, that's where I was going. What I was going at was in, at Princeton. That was where you yes. had a chance to either meet or hear John Nash, and that was your first exposure to game theory. No, that's also not quite correct. Uh, my first, ex- I met John Nash not at Princeton, but at MIT, where I did my doctorate. Uh, J- Nash had left Princeton at that time already. Nash had left Princeton, he did his doctorate, and he came to MIT in 54, if I'm not mistaken. No, in 53, in fact. He came to MIT in 53 after completing his doctorate at Princeton. And I was at MIT between 50 and 54. In 54, I went to Princeton, but Nash was no longer there. However, I did meet Nash and interact with him in uh, while in the academic year 53-54, uh, when we were both at MIT. Okay. Well, I was just trying to lay some some background, and excuse me if I got a few dates off, but I, I just wanted to kind of for the audience to let them know a little bit of your background before we get into just to let you... Look, I, I've got a fairly sophisticated audience, but when it comes to game theory, and you know this all too well, there is a certain amount of effort that you've put into your career to to go down this path. And what I'd like for you to do from the very beginning is perhaps to talk about what game theory is trying to accomplish. And also, as you're explaining that, talk about the idea of rationality. I think the way you talk about rationality, sometimes these days people say, oh, it's, it's irrational, it's rational. And I think what's really interesting when I read your work is how you say, hey, hold on, rational is not necessarily ethical or moral. So perhaps you could touch on some of these basic uh, issues before we jump in. Let's uh, let's address that question first, and afterwards we'll get back to the question of uh, what is game theory trying to accomplish. Okay. So uh, actually, I have I have a, a uh, an article with exactly that title: What is game theory trying to accomplish? Uh, but uh, first, let's let me. Uh, 
face this issue of rationality. Uh, rationality, um, from the point of view of economics, the economic definition of rationality, and this applies to all interactive situations, uh, not only economic ones, but also political, uh, international, uh, business. Uh, rational, rational means a, a person is rational if he promotes his own goals to the extent, to the best extent of his knowledge. In other words, to, as far as he knows, he is promoting his own goals. Okay. Given his knowledge, he is promoting his own goals. That's rational. It's not uh, logical thinking. It's not. It's not science. It's not uh, any any of that stuff. Yeah? It's not the, the daily use of the word. It's something else. And a student of mine um, put this uh, very nicely. He gave an example of a. Uh, a person who's walking along the street and a black cat um, crosses his path, and uh, he spits. Um, so according to the uh, usual definition of rationality, he's superstitious, and uh, he's acting irrationally by spitting. Yes, why, why spit when, when a black cat crosses your path? It's a superstition. So that's irrational. But according to the economic definition of rationality, he is, in fact, irrational if he does not spit. Yes, uh, because by spitting, he is, according to the best of his belief and knowledge, he is promoting his goals, which means because otherwise uh, he believes that something bad will happen to him if he does not spit. So if he does not spit, he's acting irrationally. So this, this is a, uh, the, the difference between the definition of rationality as it is in economics and in game theory and in everyday parlance. Uh, let's get back to your first question. Uh, what is game theory trying to accomplish? Uh, game theory uh, is an analysis of um, interactive situations in which people are striving to entities, not necessarily people. Different entities interact with each other. What each one does affects what the other one gets. And each one is trying to promote his own goals. So each one is rational. He's trying to promote his own goals, and he is taking into account that the other players are also trying to promote their goals, not his goals, but their goals. Going back in time, I think it's really interesting in, in looking at your work, discussions of Cold War diplomacy, current international relations, and I was thinking the idea of a strategy matrix, because you, you know, people make the point before we would always know what we can do. But now the idea is to think what we can both do and put the, put the shoes on at the same time. The idea is that in, in analyzing an interactive situation, a game, it's important to analyze it from, a, from above, not, not from your point of view, what should I do, yes, but uh, simultaneously, Given the possibilities given uh, that, that are open to uh, all the participants, all the players in this game, what, uh, w what possibilities are open to them and what should each one do given the possibilities that he has and that the other one has? And he must take into account that the, each player each player must take into account that the other player is also maximizing, is also trying to do the best that he can for himself. That, that's the idea of the strategy matrix. And, and like my uh, colleague Tom Schelling said, this, just this way of looking at things rather than what should I do, saying what should, what should we both do, what is good for him, what is good for me, what is good for him given what is good for me and so on. Looking at it symmetrically, 
not only two players, also more players. This is one of the central important ideas of game theory. And your career is about bringing mathematical tools to that end. Yeah, my mathematical tools for thinking about these things, yes. Conceptual tools. I don't like the word mathematics, yes. I mean, (laughs) it's a beautiful word, and and I'm a mathematician. I'm proud of it. Uh, uh, But mathematics is not the point. The point is the point is thinking about this uh, coherently. Okay, thinking about it coherently uh, and and developing tools, conceptual tools, to formulate these ideas and and to to. uh, and then, and then eventually to analyze them. Okay, physicists, uh, all all kinds of scientists use mathematics, and, and we use mathematics also. But mathematics is a tool; it's not a uh, an end in itself. Professor, let me. Can I jump into a few kind of examples that I think my audience can relate to? And geopolitics gives some some great ways where we can go in a discussion of game theory. And I think there's, a, there's current situations in the world today that are fairly hot. And for example, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, rationality. And when I look at the media coverage of something like Ukraine and Vladimir Putin, people might say, well, here's irrational. And my thought, oh, hold on, he's being perfectly rational for his situation. And sure. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's probably sure, and, and I, I think Iran also. I think a a, a uh, even more apt example. People often say that Ahmadinejad is uh, irrational, he's crazy, and so on. He's not crazy. He doesn't do what we want, but uh, but he's not crazy. He's highly rational, and and I think one should uh, one has to take this into account absolutely. And uh, as you say, Putin also. By the way, I have my doubts about American policy in the Ukraine. I think um, if one wants to uh, maintain a world peace, uh, I think Putin's reaction to Ukraine is, is in a way, um, maybe not only rational, but also uh, uh, understandable, okay? Uh, Let's put it that way. Um, We would not be very happy if... Uh, if uh, in Mexico uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, suddenly Putin suddenly made a, uh, a Russian revolution in Mexico uh, or in Canada, yes, it's not. Uh, I think uh, there are accepted spheres of influence. The, the Ukrainian uh, revolution is is rocking the boat. As we talk about conflict, geopolitics, I saw you make some comments, and it, it's very logical and very, it makes perfect sense. I think people don't want to accept this, and I'm paraphrasing a little, so forgive me. But if you want peace, prepare for war. If somebody sends a shell over at you, send a shell back. If you're ready, if you're ready for war, there's no fight. If you cry peace, you end up fighting. But you you look at that not only just in opinion terms, you get into the game theory is getting at those types of ideas, like as you say, with the conceptual framework. You know the Rome. You know when when you look at at uh, the search for peace, uh, President Obama uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, '09. Obama is a smart kid. He made a speech in Oslo on the 10th of December, 2009, uh, acceptance speech of the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize, in which he said the belief that peace is desirable is rarely enough to achieve it. And this was an understatement, and he understands the uh, he understands very well the um, the mechanics of these things. And and what he was saying is that just saying, yelling, peace, peace, does not, not only does not necessarily bring about peace, it may bring about war. We, we, we all want peace, yes? I mean, nobody wants peace more than we here in Israel do, yeah. But uh, also Americans and Europeans and uh, everybody wants peace, yes? The question is, 
exactly what what uh, um, Obama said. The belief that peace is desirable is rarely enough to achieve it. Wanting peace doesn't doesn't get you peace. Okay. What gets you peace? Well, who are the world champions in peace? The world champions. Who are when I want to play good soccer, I go and I go to Germany and I they are the world champions in soccer and I see how they play. Okay, if I want to play good baseball, I see who won the last World Series and I look at their strategies. If I want peace, I go and I look at the world champions of peace in all of history. You tell me, who are the world champions of peace in all of history? Where is there where is there any enduring peace? That doesn't happen, does it? There is no enduring peace. Where is there enduring peace, really? Well, there, there are places where there is enduring peace, yeah. For example, Switzerland. Okay? Right? Little yeah. country? Yeah. They've been at peace for several hundred years. <laughs> That's quite something. They have a great location, they know how to ski, and they have guns. Ah. Skiing, I think, is not that important, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although it plays a role, yeah. And the location is also, lots of places have good locations, yeah. And, and they're not at peace. They have guns. They have guns. They have jet planes. They have holes in the mountains. I often vacation in Switzerland. You vacation in Switzerland, whether it's in the winter or in the summer, you have the jet planes screaming overhead. What the hell do they need jet planes screaming overhead for? Why do they need fighter planes? Yeah, nobody's bothering them, right? Why do they need fighter planes? Why? 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 Uh, why uh, it's crazy. Spend all that money. Uh, people spend a month uh, every couple of years in uh, uh, military duty and reserve service. The reason is that that's why nobody bothers them. Okay? And I'll give one more example. The biggest, after the, the Swiss really have had several hundred years of peace, but in a big way, the biggest champions of peace in world history are the Romans. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, lasted for 239 years. 239 years, the whole Western world was at peace. Never, never you know, nothing, it's unbelievable, yeah? But that's what it was. And you know what their motto was? Their motto was, see this pakem para bellum, which means if you want peace, prepare for war. That's what it means. And that preparation for war is in, is in tanks, it's in guns, like you said. It's in jet planes. It's it's in uh, in uh, drones and whatever you want. But not only there. It's in another place also. It's in your head, and you have to be willing to say, and you have to mean it. You have to mean it. You know what, fellas? We want peace. But if you want to fight. Let's fight, okay? And if you can say that and mean it, then you don't have to fight. One of the things I wanted to jump into was the 2008-2009 bailouts, uh, the rescues. And, you know, obviously these types of things always invite the next crisis. But from your perspective, uh, you know, your wisdom, and, and maybe looking at this from a game theory conceptual framework, how do you look at the bailouts, the the rescues that happened during that period of time? Well, the bailouts are not a good thing. It's just like you said, it's, it's, it, 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 it gives the uh, incentives 
to uh, companies to take risks yeah, because it's uh, if if uh, I take a risk and if it works out well, you put the money in your pocket, and if it works out poorly, you'll get bailed out. Uh, so uh, you won't make any money, but you won't lose any money either. Uh, so it distorts the incentives. Incentives are to take more risks and when, they, when bailouts are. Now, on the other hand, uh, when you have uh, big, uh, big firms, uh, you know, it's control a lot of the economy, a, a failure of a firm like that can uh, really spell trouble. So, you know, I, I don't want to second-guess Bernanke. You know, it could be it could be that at least some of these bailouts were uh, were not a good thing, but they they were uh, uh, something bad that that had to be done to to prevent uh, worse from happening. Uh, but I, I don't want to go all like that. But but in principle, you're quite right that bailouts are a bad thing. Yeah, you know? it's because they give the wrong. Incentive. The, the answer is not to have too much of the economy in the hands of a small number of firms. Yes, uh, uh, maybe that's easier said than done, but uh, that's that's what to that's the principle to um, strive to, uh, so that uh, so that you don't have to make bailouts. The company fails. Uh, it fails. Uh, that's it, and and that will create the incentives to to be careful. Okay, not to take undue risks. Which uh, I I think you, you got to do that through incentives and not through uh, not through regulation. Okay, uh, you, you can't go and say to a bank, well, you can, but you shouldn't go and say to a bank, hey, you can't lend more than or you can't have a leverage rate over such and such. Uh, you shouldn't do that. The, the, the bank uh, should set its own uh, leverage rates. So it, it's important to have um, transparency. In other words, it has to say, hey, this is what I'm this is my leverage rate, and this is how much I'm lending, and this is to who I'm lending, and so on. It's very important to have transparency. But beyond that, uh, I don't think these things should be regulated for. But, uh, uh, you know, like I say, sometimes um, sometimes you've got to do things which are not optimal either. The, the, the main thing is to, to maintain competition. This is very, very the, the regulation is should be regulation should be limited to maintaining competition, which means not not having too many, too few large firms controlling the economy, and uh, of course the honesty, transparency. That, that's what regulation should be limited to. I know you said you don't want to second-guess Bernanke. I won't ask you to do that, but I'm imagining there's a side of you that deep in your stomach just doesn't like what happened in terms of the bailouts and the rescues. And I'm curious if there's a side of you that would have been curious to see what would have happened. Would, would it have truly been a meltdown or... You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. How can you tell? How can you tell? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, like I said, you're quite right. You have know, something deep down inside me that doesn't like the bailouts. You know, you're quite right, and I set that forth in my previous statement. But uh, but uh, I can understand that, uh, you know, somebody who's really running the show like the Nike was, you know, you've got to be a little careful, yeah, uh, not to... Uh, Behavioral economics, you know, quite a, quite a few advances, if one would, could say, in, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, some Nobel Prizes handed out. But I've seen you make the comment about uh, artificial lab setups and not liking that. I, I wonder if you might expand some on your perception of behavioral economics, how you see it. Uh, limitations, uh, pros, cons. 
First of all, there haven't been a number of Nobel Prizes. There's been one, okay? One, uh, Danny Kahneman, okay? There haven't been a number. Uh, well, one is a number, of course, but let's uh, let's uh, set that. Uh, I guess you could, you could say Vernon Smith, though. And that Nobel Prize is, is very interesting because it's not really a Nobel Prize. Like my Nobel Prize, it's not a full Nobel Prize. It's half a Nobel Prize, right? I shared my Nobel Prize with Tom Schelling, uh, so I got half, okay? And Danny Kahneman also got half of the Nobel Prize. Now, let's look at the other half, okay? What's the other half of that Nobel Prize in 02? Uh, the other half is Ron Smith, okay? Now, what did Danny Kahneman show? Danny Kahneman showed, uh, together with Amos Tversky, that uh, people uh, really uh, behave irrationally. They don't. Uh, they don't behave uh, uh, in accordance with the um, dictates of economic theory. They behave. They have certain rules of uh, behavior uh, that uh, that govern their yes. Uh, um, this uh, anchoring endowment effect, uh, uh, representative heuristic, all kinds of things like that. Yes. Uh, now, um, a, that's what he showed. People do not behave in accordance with the economic theory. And he did it with uh, polls, with uh, questionnaires, with uh, lab experiments, that kind of thing. Um, what, what about the other half? What about Ben Smith? Uh, um, got a little less press, yes. Uh, what about his uh, part of the Nobel Prize? Well, it's very interesting because <laughs> he showed the opposite, yeah. He showed that economic theory does work, yeah. He did lab experiments, uh, on people and it turned out that economic theory works just fine, yes. And he himself was surprised, yeah. You read his uh, Nobel uh, speech, uh, you find that uh, he himself was surprised to find how well economic theory works in the laboratory. One, one guy shows that economic theory does not work, and the other guy shows that economic theory does work, and they share a Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, you could understand the Nobel Committee saying, uh, well, we believe one and we don't believe the other. But you can't say we believe them both and we're going to give them both the Nobel Prize. That doesn't seem to make sense. So what's the answer? What, 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 what is going on over there? And the answer is that the Nobel Prize was not given for the conclusions. It was given for the methodology which was new in economics, well, not actually entirely new because experiments were carried on in, in game theory and in economics for many decades. But these two guys, Vern Smith and Danny Kahneman, who's a good friend of mine, uh, they really uh, brought it to uh, to full flower, one might say. Or at least, yeah, let's see. There were other people also, yeah, like, uh, uh, and, but uh, those two were chosen by the Nobel Committee to represent those two sides. The, the prize was given for the introduction and use of this methodology, okay, which was an important uh, methodology in economics, and it was, it was just, uh, the committee wanted to emphasize this. But still the question remains, how can, how can they have shown opposite things? Yes, how can they have made convincing cases for uh, two things that uh, contradict each other? And the answer is that they don't contradict each other. They are both basically right. Both Kahneman and Vern Smith are right. Now, how can that be? And here now I'm going to tell you how it can be. Kahneman took the um, exceptional case, okay? He said, he showed that in exceptional cases, people behave irrationally. Or let me put that more precisely. 
he said that people developed rules of thumb. Tversky and Kahneman call these rules of thumb heuristics. They develop heuristics. People do not make uh, explicit calculations. They do not optimize. Rather, they develop heuristics for how to act in the real world. And these heuristics usually work fine. They usually give optimal results. They usually give results that are rational. Not that the process is rational, but the results are rational. And each heuristics are chosen because the results are rational, usually. And they say this themselves in their original 1974 article in the magazine Science. They said these heuristics usually work fine. But occasionally, they misfire when they are misapplied, when they are applied to unusual situations, which the, uh, the practitioner, the man in the field, the subject of the experiment is not used to, then they may give and often do give systematically irrational results. And Von Smith, what he showed was that when you take the usual case, the situation to which the heuristic is meant to apply. And when you do that, then economic theory works fine. So their results do not contradict each other at all. Yeah. First of all, they didn't get the prize for the results. They got the prize for the methodology. And second of all, their results do not contradict each other. And I, I, I'm fully, uh, um, I'm fully in, go along with that stuff. Yes, I go along with Smith and with Kahneman because I say that right people do not consciously optimize. They develop heuristics for for dealing with all kinds of situations. Yeah, and these heuristics usually work well. Yeah. I call it rule rationality. They develop rules of behavior, and the rules are, uh, as a rule, they are rational. So that's, uh, that's my response to that question. Listen, I have one more question for you, if you can. And I want to kind of go back in time a little bit. And I've seen in going and preparing to talk to you, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, which is the idea of you know professional diplomats They don't really think in terms of payoffs and outcomes. But I would like for you, and and maybe even to use a historical example, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis and how that crisis, how game theory entered that crisis, how the the conceptual frameworks that have become part of your life entered that crisis. And if you could comment on something, look, it's a big subject. We could talk for a long time. I could pick your brain all day about that subject. But I wonder if you might be able to give a big overview in a short bit of time. Well, you know, uh, Tom Schelling, um, in his Nobel acceptance speech, uh, he, that, that speech was called uh, The Amazing 60 Years. And uh, this was in the uh, winter of 05, no, sorry, in, in, uh, in December of 05, late fall of 05. And so the 60 years was uh, started in 1945. And what was amazing about that period from 45 to 05 is something that did not happen. And what did not happen was uh, that uh, an atomic weapon was not exploded in anger for 60 years. For 60 years, there have been atomic weapons in the international arena, and not once was an atomic weapon uh, exploded in anger. So that was the title of his Nobel acceptance speech. And Tom himself had a lot to do with that, by the way, because he was a a game theorist, and he was uh, an influential uh, figure in Washington during uh, much of that period. What was going on really in the Cold War? What what what, what made it happen that the, those sixty years, those amazing sixty years, were really 
really did happen, yes, and what did not happen, yes, that 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 the that event uh, that he was talking about did not happen. What brought that about? Well, a lot of people during that period uh, were for nuclear disarmament, okay, and there was a lot of talk about a lot of agitation for uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, during that entire period, I remember being uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and seeing a bumper sticker on a car uh, that said, uh, "One nuclear explosion could ruin your whole day." Uh, now, of course, that was meant to be amusing, and it was amusing. It's a nice uh, quip. But but it was symptomatic of the agitation that was during that entire period for uh, nuclear disarmament. Now the truth is that what kept the world from uh, entering into the abyss of, uh, of of turning the Cold War into a hot war, what kept the world from that was the presence of nuclear weapons. Uh, it is it is paradoxical. I mean, it's paradoxical that the presence of nuclear weapons can not to disarm the armament, yes, can prevent a Holocaust. And how does that happen? What, what, what was it that prevented World War Three? What prevented World War Three is that is that the you know, um, I would say uh, over 40 years old, just well over 40, somewhat over 40 years, and from about late 40s to late 80s, 40 years, there were no bombers carrying nuclear weapons in the air, in the air, okay, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 40 years. Uh, 365 days a year, including Christmas. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, all the time there were um, nuclear bombers in the air, and that's what prevented the war. Okay, that sounds funny to have bombers in the air, and that's what prevents the war. But that is what happened, and that's game theory. Okay, that is game theory, and and uh, I think uh, that played a role in the. Um, Cuban Missile Crisis also, probably. And uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a very, very serious affair. I thought the world was coming to an end, or, you know, might very well come to an end. Not, not in, in a year, but in, in two or three weeks, yeah. Uh, it was very, very serious. Kennedy, um, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I would have had the guts to, to play it the way he played it, but... Uh, uh, he did, and cooler heads, namely Khrushchev, uh, prevailed, and uh, it came out okay. Uh, uh, came out okay. I think another interesting insight from that period was the uh, shelter uh, construction, the fallout shelter construction. Uh, craze uh, in uh, 1960-61, that was before the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a craze of building fallout shelters in the United States. People would build these shelters and they would, e they would equip them uh, with food and drink and so on, and also uh, machine guns to keep, not to keep the Russians out, but to keep the neighbors out. And, and this uh, you know, it has continued for a period, I don't know, several months or a year or two. Then it died down. Now, this uh, fallout uh, building, for a, for a shelter building cra shelter building craze, created a, a, a very serious uh, detente between the United States and Russia. Uh, the, the Russians considered this an aggressive act. Now, how can building a fallout shelter be considered aggressive? But you see, uh, it, for this you need game theory. When you build a fallout shelter, 
you are reducing your um, your vulnerability. That's the word I was looking for. You are reducing your vulnerability to attack on the other side. But the attack on the other side is just like I was explaining up to now, is that's what was keeping the peace. So this was considered an aggressive move. Okay. I Thank you, sir. Has been, um, helpful. Yeah, it's great. I appreciate you taking the time today. It's a privilege. And, you know, I think you, you probably have lived your life like this, giving back to other people and teaching. I feel privileged to have had a little bit of time with you to, uh, to learn in the last couple of days. So I thank you. Okay. My pleasure. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.